So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Abrahams, uh, and I'm a Los Angeles based machine learning engineer. Uh, one of the things that I am known for, known for, I don't like saying that, but one of the projects that I'm uh, a part of is the uh, TensorFlow white paper notes. Uh, essentially, it's just this annotated uh, guide to the white paper. Uh, written for TensorFlow and released back in November. If you guys haven't read it and are interested in how uh, TensorFlow is set up, what its infrastructure looks like, I highly recommend it. It's a very uh, enjoyable, uh, easy to read, but uh, interesting uh, white paper. I also uh, am the maintainer for the TensorFlow for Raspberry Pi. So if you guys are interested in uh, trying out uh, TensorFlow on your Raspberry Pi, trying out some of the distributed functions of uh, TensorFlow. I uh, have binaries up there for both Python 2, Python 2 and Python 3, so check those out, obviously, completely free. And I uh, am a contributor to the uh, TensorFlow project. It's obviously a lot of fun getting the opportunity to work uh, with, like, even though it's digitally with a lot of these uh, really talented engineers. And if you guys want to improve yourselves, uh, improve your engineering ability, um, I highly, highly recommend getting out there, just finding something, right? Anything that you think could be moderately improved, just go out there, give it your best shot, and they, uh, the people in charge of the TensorFlow project will guide you and help you, you solve the problem. They won't just do it for you. Okay, so I, I, this talk is uh, going to be a sprint. There's a lot of things I'm trying to cover, and I, need, I actually want to ask you guys. Uh, so it seems like pretty much everyone here is for TensorFlow, which is fantastic. Um, so just by show of hands, timid or not, uh, how many people have used TensorFlow before? Okay. How many people have read about, ten, like, sort of understand what TensorFlow is? They have a good idea. They've done some research, uh, and they pretty much know what, what's going on with TensorFlow. OK. And then how many people ha have heard about TensorFlow but really don't know very much about it other than it's used for machine learning, it's cool, it's, it's fast, Google made it, and I want to get a part of it? OK. <laughs> okay, so we got like a, a fairly diverse mix of people. So we'll be going through this, and I'll do my best to uh, be thorough. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't want to bore those who are using TensorFlow. So uh, we're going to go over some of the core TensorFlow API and terminology. I don't want anybody to be left behind <laughs> as we move forward. Um, it's the, on the whole, TensorFlow isn't a very complex uh, workflow, but you don't want to be, I don't want people to get lost when we start talking about uh, graphs and edges and adding nodes and all that. Um, like I said, we'll talk about the TensorFlow workflow. I want to show you guys some example TensorFlow code, and we're going to try to do a little bit of a, a, li a mini live coding session. I, you know, you don't want to have those go too long, but I do want to showcase some really cool features of TensorFlow. Uh, we'll go over TensorBoard, uh, oh, TensorBoard being one of the really, really cool uh, uh, visualization software that's comes with TensorFlow. It's just like part of the package. It's great. Okay, so let's talk about the TensorFlow programming model. If any of you guys have used Theano before, it's very very similar. It's another uh, it's another uh, graph based engine, computation graph based engine. Uh, the user facing API. So most pretty much everybody using TensorFlow on a day to day basis is going to be interfacing it with Python. But it is the mo majority of the actual execution code is written in C++. So that the idea is that we have this very user-friendly, nice Python interface in the front, but the actual meat uh, going on underneath is this already compiled C++ code, which allows it to be much more efficient than uh, the uh, uh, something like Python. <coughs> So the computational code, as said, was written in, is written in C++, and there are separate implementations for either CPU or GPU for each of the functions written in TensorFlow. So uh, if something, in general, everything is capable of being run on CPU, and if it can get additional benefit of being run on a GPU, or if, there, if it just is possible to run it on a GPU, even if it isn't highly parallelized, uh, TensorFlow is able to decide to put uh, operations either on the CPU or GPU based on what is possible to go where. 
uh, if any of you, if this is a data science uh, hub, it would seem. So I'm, I assume that a lot of you guys are uh, familiar, at least, with NumPy. It's one of the uh, lingua francas of data science. It's, uh, it's the ultimate Python uh, n-dimensional array library. Uh, TensorFlow is designed to be completely and utterly integrated with uh, NumPy. You can pass in NumPy objects as, uh, as if they were TensorFlow objects. And uh, objects returned at the end of uh, TensorFlow set, uh, runs are actually NumPy objects, which means you can seamlessly go from manipula manipulating your data, passing it into a TensorFlow graph, and then getting receiving some data transformed data, and then playing around with it some more with NumPy. OK. So TensorFlow pro programming pretty much, at the end of the day, boils down to two steps. The first step is to build the graph that you want to run. So you build a node, you have all these different steps, right? And you haven't run it yet. Then you use a TensorFlow session to run it as many times as you want. So the, in, for machine learning, right, the idea here is that you build a graph, you build your model that is what you, that will be your uh, uh, prediction step, right? And then you have a, you, uh, we analyze the error, then we do some sort of gradient descent. Back, uh, if for a neural network, you back propagate, right? Uh, and then you run it multiple, multiple times, with each run uh, rep corresponding to a single uh, training batch. Right? Makes sense? Pretty good? OK, cool. All right, so let's talk about graphs. Uh, so the, the, at the core of everything is the graph, right? Um, it's the primary structure of TensorFlow. And in general, when you're making your own models, you're only going to have a single graph that you're dealing with. But you should know that TensorFlow is capable of handling multiple graphs. And that may or may not come up later. I'm not, I don't remember exactly what's going on but, uh, with, with this guy. But you should know that it's possible to run multiple graphs. And there's no reason not to. In fact, you can think of one big graph, right? You can, you can think of it as being able to be split in half and being two separate graphs, if you'd like, right? Uh, nodes represent computations or data transformation. So I don't know how many of you guys are uh, familiar with, your ba with basic graphs and graph theory. It's pretty much just circles and lines. Uh, but nodes represent computations or data transformations. And uh, edges represent data transfer. So you'll have circles that represent computations like add or multiply or matrix multiply. And then the, comp the uh, edges between them, the lines connecting those, are arrows saying, OK, this, the output from this addition is going to move on to the next node, which might be multiplication. OK, so we're going to basically go through this. Hopefully, this isn't too dull. But I don't want to leave anybody behind if, no, if people haven't seen graphs in mathematical form before. So what is a data flow graph? It's also known as a computational graph, right? It's just a very nice way to visualize and abstract mathematical computations. Uh, so this is a very simple graph showcasing the addition, right? So we have some input A. We have some input B, right? They move their data. So here we have the number B moving up to this node. We have the number A moving to this node. We end up with A plus B. And then this uh, plus multiple. Uh, operation will output some, the value of a plus b. Pretty simple, right? And the idea is that we can chain these together. We already went through these, the nodes and edges before, right? So we have nodes representing operations. We have edges representing numbers. So why use graphs? One, they're super highly compositional. That means that they are incredibly flexible for research, pur for research purposes. So the uh, Theano. Uh, Torch, a lot of these other uh, machine learning libraries are useful because it allows uh, researchers to kind of put together these very fluid and flexible gra uh, uh, models without having to worry about whether or not their library can support it, right? Um, it, if you're using this very heavy handed layer by layer approach, you may not be able to get the sort of flexibility that you're looking for and may not be able to tweak your model 
to the degree necessary to get that extra percentage of uh, correct estimation. In addition, uh, graphs are useful for calculating derivatives. If any of you guys remember your chain rule, yeah, anyone? Anyone up for calculus? No? Uh, if you guys are getting into machine learning, I highly recommend you falling in love with calculus again. Uh, not the hard parts of calculus, just like the easy derivative bits. Um, <laughs> that's not true. You should learn all of it. Um, but uh, th th basically, what you can do with the chain rule, if you, if you recall your chain rule, I don't want to like, pull out the whiteboard, but basically, you can s you, the idea is that we have a function f of x, right, and we have a function g of x, or g of y, right? And then we, want, we have the, the problem of g of f of x, right? And so the goal is to get the derivative of g with respect to x. But we have this y in the middle. We need to figure out how to get, like, how do we get there? And the answer is you take the derivative of g with respect to y and multiply that with, by, of f with respect to x. And math, math happens, and you have what you want, right? So the key, the key with that is that you can, the, the whole reason they call it the chain rule is that you can, it doesn't just go two layers deep, right? It goes very deep, uh, deep. <laughs> and that's why they call it deep learning, right? So you can basically start with, you can have this layer, a network that is many, many layers deep, has, goes very far back, and you can get the correct uh, derivative with respect to any of your inputs, right? And if any of you guys have gone through uh, like your basic neural network training, you, you know that backpropagation is all about calculating the chain rule backwards throughout a graph. Cool? That's another reason why we use graphs. It's also easier to implement, implement distributed computing. This is pretty straightforward. Basically, if you can segment your computation into individual chunks, it's way easier to place them on different graphs and on different threads. And it's already segmented nicely, you see? And like I said, neural networks are pretty much already computation graphs. OK, I'll try to sprint through this faster. Tensors, just in case you guys are uncomfortable with that terminology, all they are is an abstraction of a matrix, right? So if a two-dimensional tensor is a matrix, a one-dimensional tensor is a vector, a zero-dimensional Tensor is just a scalar or just a single number. And then as you go higher, you can have a three you can imagine a three-dimensional matrix as a cube if you want, and a four-dimensional matrix as a hypercube or whatever. Um, in reality, there you just think of them as any sort of higher dimensional arrays or matrices, right? If if you in general in TensorFlow, most of the math actually happens in two dimensions anyway. Um, that's not the case for every operation, but in general, if it is easier for you to just think of them as matrices, feel free to do so. I won't judge you. And that's what's important. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so just to, to go over how you would define tensors in uh, TensorFlow for those who haven't seen it, uh, you can either do them as standard uh, Python lists. So you can see up here on the top, we have a scalar, it's just a single number. You can pass this into TensorFlow operations, and it'll just read it as a, a tensor, right? Same thing with a single vector, right? Or we can have a list of lists and have a matrix, or we can have a list of lists of lists and have a three-dimensional tensor, and you can go even further. Uh, or, in, like I said, you can, uh, the TensorFlow integrates seamlessly with NumPy. And you can basically do the same thing. We use the same sort of uh, uh, verbiage, I guess, right? But in, wrap it in an np.array wrapper. And the, the reason you would want to do this, uh, and it, this is actually pretty important. You, won't, you probably won't see this very much uh, in the slides, but I encourage you as you're learning TensorFlow to use NumPy for this, is you can specify the exact type of data type that you'd like. Um, uh, Python is a very loosely, loosely typed language, uh, weakly typed even. Um, and the, the thing is, TensorFlow has a very robust selection of types available to it, uh, which go all the way down to the C++ implementation. But because Python doesn't have a way of speci like directly specifying whether or not you want a 32-bit floating point in, uh, or a 64-bit floating point number or 64-bit integer, et cetera, 
you aren't able to, do, to specify that information without using NumPy. Um, so if you use NumPy, you can do exactly that. And you won't have to deal with weird, like tight mismatch errors as you move along, OK? So that's, my, that's, that's piece of advice number one. So like I said, please use NumPy arrays. <laughs> Uh, I'm not doing it because I'm lazy this time, and it's space is limited. <laughs> okay, uh, like I said, op I've been using the phrase operations. You'll also see the word op. We, I've been intentionally trying to st not say op because of DevOps and that whole field. It maybe can like, just no, just don't bother with that. I'll say operations with a capital O. Uh, they represent any sort of computations, and in TensorFlow, an operation is, a, is you'll see it as a Python function. You call it, you pass in your inputs, zero or more tensors as an input, and it will do any sort of computation. So these computations can be as simple as adding two tensors together. They can do something that has nothing to do with math itself, but may initialize variables. They may do other uh, operations that uh, affect the graph in one way or another, right? But the main idea is that you pass in zero or more tensors, they return uh, zero or more tensors, and the big thing that may uh, catch some people off is that they don't immediately execute, right? The idea is that you re you are, re what you get after you uh, run that Python function is a handle to that operation, right? You get a handle to the output of that operation. You can pass that output to another operation, or you can run that output and have the graph run to that point. So just remember when you are dealing with operations, they won't run instantaneously. So when you say, OK, A equals 1, and B equals 2, and C equals TF dot add A plus the A and B, right? You won't get the number 3. You'll get a handle. You'll get an, a, a TensorFlow operation which will, uh, if you run, right, which we'll go over later, will return three. OK, hopefully I'm not uh, making it more. Say that, say that again. Basically, the transformation and the inputs are binded, but not getting. Exactly. So th that's exactly it. The idea is that you have access to the, the operation itself, like the concept of the operation. And it knows that it's taking in those inputs. But it hasn't actually, it, it's lately evaluating that lazily, right? So here's just a quick example, right? So we're using the simple multiplication. This isn't matrix multiplication. It's just simple, basic multiplication. First, we import TensorFlow. Well, by convention, we shorten that to TF because writing TensorFlow every time is sadistic. Um, we are going to just create, we're going to say A equals TF.mol. And you'll notice we're just passing these in directly. Like, as I said, I'm not using NumPy because I'm a bad person. Um, and we're getting we're, what A is is a handle to this uh, multiplication node, right? But when we get it, it doesn't, it doesn't return the number 15 yet. What we have to do is start a session. And we'll talk more about sessions soon. Uh, and then, once we have opened up a session, we can run it. And then, finally, it returns 15. Hooray. <laughs> OK, so let's talk a little bit about placeholders. So placeholders are your input nodes. So you can imagine, as you're running graphs, that you're not always going to want to use a static like you're not going to want to use the same numbers every time you run the graph. When you're doing uh, machine learning, you're going to need to be passing it uh, training data. And you're going to need to be uh, giving it the labels for that data as well, right? So the idea is that you give, uh, for TensorFlow, in order for it to be able to compute uh, matrix multiplications, it needs to know the, the dimensions of the matrices, right? So when you specify a placeholder, you say, well, TensorFlow, I don't have any data for you yet, but I do know it's going to be 100 by 400. So you can calculate all the other shapes you need to do in order to make sure everything matches nicely. Um, so when you create a, a placeholder, that's exactly what you do. You give it the data type, and you give it the shape. You can also, get, just as a side note, you can give all these uh, nodes names, which I'll be doing in the live coding demo. as It's good practice, but um, 
just for the, the essential things you have to do, you, you, have a, uh, you just need to give it the data type and the shape. And then you can use my placeholder as you would any other tensor. You can pass that into a, an addition uh, operation or a multiplication operation or a matrix multiplication operation. OK, now let's talk about actually running a session. OK, so the, the session is in charge of uh, coordinating your graph. So TensorFlow, by default, you know, has one graph. And it's just kind of hanging out in the background. And as you are coding and adding in more and more nodes, it's keeping track of what's going where, who's outputting to what, what dependencies are involved, right? And the session is the, the master of that. And the most important method, as we saw before, is the run method. Uh, it's what actually will run the graph and get you what you want. So it takes in uh, two parameters. Uh, there's fetches and there's feed dict. So fetches is a list of objects, and those objects are tensors, nodes in your graph that you'd like to get the results for. And your common example is the final layer in a neural network, but you can actually pass it in any tensor that's in your graph. So the idea is if there's, something, there's, if there's an operation that you would like to run, then you just pass it in to the TensorFlow session. And the reason that this is nice is that you can, if you'd like, you don't have to run your entire graph if that's not what you're interested in. And because of the, the nature of uh, your graphs, it's only going to run the, uh, the nodes previous, right? The, the dependencies of that node. And it won't run the entire graph for no reason. The, say that again? So by default, it's going, if you just, uh, run session.run, it's going to just print it to the console. You can save it as an output, right? So uh, these operations will output zero or more tensors, right? So for, for example, if we ran the, this, the back, going back to the add, right, or the multiplication, by default, it's just going to print out the number 15. Uh, if you, you can save that to a variable if you'd like, and you can uh, Oh, oh, are you asking, uh, cache, cache, sorry, caching as you run? Yes, I meant sorry. in terms of, let's say, if it's on already partially processed a graph, will it not need to reprocess that so that you can incrementally parse? Yeah, so from what I understand, it will do its best, the, the, though the, 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 the issue is that for many <coughs> of the most commonly used graphs, it's, you won't, like, when you're doing training, right, it's the, the caching of, data is use, isn't very useful because you end up having a dependency on a placeholder or your input, which changes each time you run, right? Uh, but TensorFlow does its best to, to not like, waste people's time and memory, right? <laughs> Going back. OK, and then this feed dict. <laughs> Uh, param uh, parameter. So we talked about how we have placeholders. There's actually a number of ways to give uh, values to those placeholders, to those input values. Uh, what we, the sort of most common way you would see it uh, done these days uh, is when you're not doing, especially when you're not doing a distributed session, um, is to use this feed dict parameter. Basically, a feed, what all the feed dict is, is uh, you give it the you give it a dictionary. That's what the dict part is, uh, where the uh, key that you pass into it is the handle to the node that you want to uh, give the input value to. Right? You give it the handle to your placeholder node, and then the value that you uh, in the dictionary is the tensor value that you want to give it. Right? So in the previous one, I don't know if I have an example. I can show it in later. Yeah. Um, I can type this in later. But for the previous example, for this placeholder, we would give it a feed dictionary where the key is my placeholder, just the, not no quotes around it, just my placeholder. And then the value would be this 100 by 400 tensor that we want to run. Cool. Okay, here we go, here we go. TensorFlow variables, these are variables that persist over time and that you want uh, to, that uh, will, basically be able to take on different values and uh, slowly change over time or drastically change over time. Uh, so maybe like weights in your neural network that you want to train, or any parameters in your machine learning network. Like I said, weights and biases. 
uh, and the, like you said, as you, if you know machine learning, the, the final values that you have after you train, these will be the, parameter, the main parameters that you've been trying to get. Uh, before you run in the graph, you have to initialize them, and that's just part of the uh, housekeeping of a TensorFlow session. The basic idea is we, the TensorFlow has to know when you want, to, like we give the variable a starting value, but it doesn't know exactly when you want to give it that. Because it's possible that you train for uh, a, a while, and then you want to, it's possible that you start at zero, and then you train, and then you're like, ah, I messed up, I want to start again. So there's a, there's a node, or there's an operation uh, called initialize variable uh, that you can use to initialize a single variable, and then you can use uh, a helper method for that that says initialize all of my variables that will set your variables to the starting value that you give them. Sorry for spewing that at you. <laughs> at you. Um, so uh, there used to be um, the like, and still in most of the documentation, you'll see this TensorFlow dot variable uh, like direct call as the way to initialize your variables. Is this okay? Uh, but for a multitude of reasons, mainly having to do with having, uh, trying to give your uh, variables, or pass your variables around uh, to different uh, scopes, variable scopes. It's best practice to use uh, tf.getVariable. Um, the, the, this, like, this is hard to cover without having to, being able to describe what variable scopes are, but the basic idea is you can have variables with uh, similar names that are in, um, you can have a graph, right? So imagine this big, big old graph, and we have, we define a variable over in this section, right? And this section, for the most part, doesn't see this section of the graph over here. The main, the big thing though is that they have one variable that they both want to be able to manipulate. And it just becomes a lot simpler if you use tf.getVariable uh, because you give it a specific name and you're able to call it from there. So that's the basic idea of why you want to use get, uh, get variable. That said, I'm probably going to just end up using tensorflow.variable anyway because these graphs we're making are pretty straightforward. Um, when you have, when you want to update, assign, update its uh, value directly, you can use the assign method. Okay, so finally we're, we're sort of closing the loop of this, the, this intro section. So this co uh, what we're trying to do here is create this, this node here, or this graph, with TensorFlow code. So you create the, once you create this placeholder variable, you're going to end up with x, right? So we're calling, we're calling our placeholder x, so bam, we're going to get this uh, graph here. Then we're going to have a TensorFlow variable that's going to have the starting value of zero, and so then that just gets placed onto the graph. Nothing's executed yet, right? And then we're going to create a new node called Y, and we're going to uh, have that be the assign uh, method, or rather, I should say, uh, we're going to assign the value of. Uh, we have a node called like we have a node that's going to be the assign operation. And it is going to take in the values of start, which is itself, right? Uh, and then also it's going to take in x here. Sorry. <laughs> so the basic idea is that each one of these, each one of these uh, uh, lines of code represents an operation. And then the ways that we pass in the values to each other define the edges. Yes, sir? Uh, sorry for the naive question, but I see that this statement there. So what is a graph is on this uh, x and start point into the other node? Say that again. How does the system determine the node x and node start should actually point to? They're just three statements, right? Yeah. So how do, how does how does it know that they should move okay. together here? Okay. So the basic idea is, so we start with node x, right? And when we first define the code, we would have just x by itself with no arrows pointing anywhere. It's just a node hanging out in space. Uh, it, we have, we have, like, as the programmer, have access to its output, right? Um, but for now, all the program cares about is like, okay, x is hanging out. That's all we care about. And then the same thing with start it, in isolation of x. X is still here with no arrows, but for all intents and purposes, start is hanging out by itself. But once we 
call this assign method, once we call this assign operation, all of a sudden we, we start with saying, OK, we're going to place this assign operation. We're going to call it y. But we're just going to have this assign operation placed on the node. So let's, what inputs do we need? Like what values do we need in order to make this run? And we see, oh, we have a handle for the start, this value start. And then it was, OK, so that means we need to place this, this operation here because we're taking it in as an input. Technically, this is going to get turned into an add operation, and then the add operation is going to get placed up here. But for simplicity's sake, we're just going to stick with this. Um, so we're saying, OK, we're taking in the start value as, a, as an input, right? And that goes up here. So this is because of the input. So if you say that y equals x plus 1, start when you bind it. Exactly. So it basically, the way it works is it knows that it needs to place an, uh, an operation down on the graph. And then it looks at its inputs and says, oh, these are the, these are the things that I'm dependent on. That means I'm going to have an edge here, right? And so this node, actually, if you look at it, will keep track of its own dependencies, and that's how it knows. Oh, in order for me, to, in order for me to run, I know that I need both of these guys to have run. I need to know what their outputs are, right? Cool. Any more questions on that? Yes, sir. Okay. So the the uh, this. Start uh, uh, this start variable is actually a variable variable. So this is a TensorFlow variable object, right? So it's not a, a Python variable. Um, it is a variable object which has its own sets of methods, and one of those methods is the assign method, which is its own. Even though it's an internal method, it's still an operation. If that makes sense, right? Um, yeah, so it, that's that's what it is. Assign is a method of exactly correct. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I missed the the, the detail. Of this. Oh, so so the thing x is a placeholder, right? So uh, start is a is a variable object, right? Um, you can use it as a t as a tensor. It will be converted into a proper tensor object. I'm not sure if it, I don't think it inherits from tensor, but the uh, variable has its own set of methods. A placeholder will, will, would have its own, and it doesn't have a sign as its own, right? Cool. Does sign update the value of start? Yes. So a sign then uh, a sign doesn't. Uh, Increment it or do something else. It gives you, you give it the exact value that you want, right? So if you wanted to increment it by one, you would say start plus one, if that makes sense, right? It's so bec what this operation does is it increment this increments start, right? So start, we want to give a new value to start. We want that new value to be start plus some value. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, this was. Uh, it, I, to be honest, I wrote this this slide uh, a, a, like a, possibly a month or two ago, and I haven't looked at it, and it needed to be updated. So yes, it is very poorly constructed. It is still <laughs> technically correct, but yes, I apologize for the confusion of the uh, of of that. Right. I, my goal was to to util, like showcase the variable uh, functionality, um, and it just happened to be. Done in maybe not the most helpful way. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so as you build up these graphs, multiple nodes and chain up, can you have a feedback loop where it's actually a graph? Right. Edge feedback, like the control system feedback. Right. So the question is is it possible to have essentially a cyclic graph? Is it possible for it at, at some point? Where we have all these, you know, again we have more nodes, and then eventually we have a value over here that says like, oh, what if start equals that, right? And then we end up having this endless feedback loop. So it's a very good question, uh, and the answer in in short is no. You can't really you, it, because of the way dependencies work, right? In theory, you end up with a paradox like chicken. What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, the start or the 
operation that came before start, which is also after start. So you'll see, you'll see graphs or recurrent neural networks that look like, uh, we need to have a, a cyclic graph, right? You'll see, I wish I had uh, a way to draw this out and not scribble on this, but essentially a common, can I draw on this wall? It looks like it's drawable, okay. So you'll see, you'll see recurrent neural network basic things, right? that essentially look like something like this, right? Where they have this, uh, they like feed, it looks like they feed back into themselves, right? And the, the, the thing is, this model, like this infinite model of recurrent neural networks is really more theoretical than something that we can actually do, right? We, could, we can't go infinitely into the past and we can't go infinitely into the future. So what we end up doing is uh, what's called unrolling uh, the the model, right? So when you see something like this, right, what's actually happening isn't this thing that's feeding back into itself infinitely. What you're actually seeing is something that's closer to so now, like, we're going to rotate this because there's not a lot of horizontal. So now we're going to say instead of, it would be like feeding like this. So we're going to say like we're we're, check, we're checking out this value here, and then we have the same model up here, and we have an output there, and we have this, and it just keeps going up as many times as we'd like. And it se may seem difficult to see like how this matches the recurrent model, but the idea is, okay, we started at po this point in time here. We feed it into our model, it does some processing, and we're gonna observe it out, we're gonna observe its output at that time. And then we're going to feed it back into the same model, right? And the key that makes this work is that the weights, right, all the all the big weight matrices in here are identical and they are updated at the same time. Okay? And as soon as you do that, you end up with a model that in effect uh, em emulates in a, a, a true recursion, right? A true um, cyclic graph without having the, the headaches of a cyclic dra graph dependency. Um, so the, in the, in if you wanted to try to do that in TensorFlow, the reality is uh, as soon, what happens is if you tried to reassign start to a value that's, if you tried to reassign va the value of start to uh, it, like a new a new operation, right? So let's say we now take this, right? Afterwards, we say start equals y plus two or whatever it is in TensorFlow speak, right? And we're like, oh, did we do it? Did we break TensorFlow? Well, under the hood, uh, what's actually happening is there is a, the graph is getting defined node by node. And what's actually happening is this original start that we use is staying right there, right? What's happened, what would happen is that we create a new node, right, somewhere maybe up here, right? And it says, okay, it's y equals x plus start plus two, right? Uh, so we're like y plus two, and we're gonna call it start. So just because it has the same variable name doesn't mean that it's gonna get it's going to bump the old start off the graph. What we will lose is the handle, the, what, because we're changing this uh, Python variable, right? We're changing what that's pointing to. And instead of this, the word start pointing to this, it's going to point to the new operation in the graph. Does that answer your question? Do you feel good? Or do you want? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, not. I, I'm, you, you'll have to ask this guy, but I'm not sure whether, like, are all tensors immutable always? Okay, cool. I thought so, but I didn't want to say that because I'm like, eh. Yeah, indeed, one uh, very confusing thing is when people try to modify one field of the tensor, like mm -hmm. tensor yeah. flow barks, and yeah. a lot of stack overflow questions say, right, why I can't do this? No, you have to create a new tensor with a different uh, element for that field. Yeah, cool. But it's a very, very good question. It's that's like something that's fun to explore. Um, so yeah, that's that's building a graph and also recurrent neural networks and also unrolling them. Um, <laughs> okay, so we we are. I mean, we've already gone through this. I don't want to to 
to basically run this into the dirt. The basic idea is you start a session, you uh, have to initialize the variables, right? So that's what I was talking about before. This initialize all variables is a, an op, and I forgot to put in parentheses here. Um, you have to run that operation, and then you're allowed to use the variable. OK, and then this is a terminology thing, the term devices. So a device is a CPU or a GPU. It does not mean a computer or a whole machine. Uh, a machine can have multiple devices. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this in the news, but Google announced that they've made their own like tensor processing <laughs> units for their cloud computing. It's going to be so cool, except they're so expensive and maybe not practical. Um, but you know, kind of fun. Um, so yeah, just know that multi-device doesn't necessarily mean distributed. If you have a regular computer with a GPU on it, you can run a multi-device setup because you can run it on, have part of it execute on the GPU and part of it execute on the CPU, but it all stays within the same machine. Okay. So we're going to try to turn this into, I, like, I, feel like this, I'm, I, I feel like I'm going on for a long time, but I don't, I don't know what the time limits we have here. But I want to do talk about TensorBoard quickly because it's very cool. And if you've worked with TensorFlow and haven't used it, it's very easy to, to make just a lot of great use out of it. Uh, basically, TensorBoard allows you to visualize your models. It allows you to visualize statistics from your, gra from your models. Uh, and it can help you make sure that you are doing, <laughs> like basically it can help you make sure that you are uh, that your models match what you've sketched out on paper, right? So uh, let's. I'd want to do a brief live dev demo. I don't. I don't need to get into the like crazy details about um, the scalars, like doing a bunch of summaries. But I want to just show you guys how easy it is to just visualize your graph instantly. Okay. So we're going to close out of this. We're going to open up uh, terminal. Let's start this guy up. OK. So we're going to create a new uh, TensorFlow, uh, Python notebook. We're going to import TensorFlow. Oh, I wish there was a way to do this. We're going imp to import TensorFlow. And we're going to import TensorFlow as TF. OK. So we run this. It's going to go perfect. OK. So now let's create our basic graph. OK. So we're going to say A equals some basic tensor. And like I said, I'm a bad person. I'm not using NumPy. Um, so we have this. And then we're going to have b equals, um, uh, let's do one, two. We're going to make this an actual matrix. One, two, three, comma, four, five, six, comma, Seven, eight, nine. <coughs> cool. So now we have these two uh, tensors that we're going to be able to use. And now we're going to want to do a matrix multiply. So we'll say C equals TF dot mat mol. Let's see if I get these right on the first time. I'm going to say B and A. I can't remember if that's going to be right. Damn, backwards. No, what did I do? Transpose B. What's that right there? I believe, I think, maybe, oh, this guy needs to be, yeah, you're right. I think if we do that, maybe. There we go. Thank you. OK. Uh, sorry. This, so this vectors in mat ve vectors, bad. Matrices, good. OK. So now we have these nodes on our graph. And now we can open up the session. And now, like, just as a demo, we can say session.run C, and we should get the correct array, right? Hooray. But that's not what we're here for. What we're here for is to open up a, a, a writer. Is it summary writer or yeah? You're gonna have to run it for a, for a bit to see to the graph, right? Mm -mm. No, the, these it's actually pretty fast. I feel like it's this isn't opening itself up right. 
wanted to double check this. Summary writer, we have to pass it in the, is it, yeah, we have to pass it in a log directory. So the first value is just uh, the, the, my graph, right? So it's going to output some data here. And then we also need to pass it in the actual, uh, the, the graph of this session. So session.graph. Did I do this right? No, it's not. What did I do wrong here, Fabrizio? I feel like summary writer is not right. The name is right. I think the model is right. Hmm? The model is not yet.frame. Can you use the question mark to get the documentation? I mean, I, I just don't see summary writer thing. Who? I think, deep apologies. We're going to go to the TensorFlow API real quick. Doo, doo, doo. Just as a side note, the TensorFlow API resources are actually trained. not trained. Thank you, sir. No, part of the magic is that you don't need to do, like, we're not, we're not going to be going over the, the crazy, like, the uh, s summary statistics. Um, that are available because that's a little bit more involved. Um, so the same thing, my my graph, Oop. and then we're passing in the graph that we'd like it to uh, that we'd like it to write. Great. Okay. So now it doesn't look like much has happened, but if we go into this notebook, we close this out, and then we look. Well, it's going to be huge, but we're going to go into we're going to start a tensor board. If we look up somewhere, we should see, uh, yeah, it's somewhere in there. OK. Let's do tensor board, and then we'll say log dir equals my graph. OK, great. So now we, it's, we see that there's something happening. We have uh, so, something good on, on port 6006. So if we go to uh, localhost and 6006, we're going to get brought to TensorBoard. And you'll see there's no scalar data. This is what I meant when we're not showing any uh, summary statistics. But if we go to graph, look at that. So we have our, our inputs here. Yeah, look cool. I know I, I, knew I, did. I knew I was going to make you guys happy at some point. Um, yeah, so for all my rambling, I sort of know what I'm doing. So basically, you can see that we just wrote in three different and I apologize for all this. It's just the low resolution on the when presenting. But what what TensorFlow is is this highly interactive, very very cool way of visualizing your nodes very quickly, right? And so you can see that you have data coming in. You can click on any of your attributes and take a look see at some of its uh, information. And as this scales up, you can uh, create names uh, namespaces which allow you to basically minimize your graph into bigger and smaller spaces. In fact, I can, uh, oh, it, it's not, not really worth it. But basically, all you need to do like, to get yourself started with TensorBoard, add your, add, just add in a uh, tf.train.summaryWriter, pass in your graph, and you're going to be able to uh, immediately start visualizing your graph and seeing it. And you won't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to do, you don't have to do anything else. It's just like, oh, great. I can sanity check to make sure that I'm not doing anything really dumb. Um, so you can write code from your picture? So un unfortunately, TensorBoard is not a li like a live uh, stream. What it does is it, it saves data to that my graph file or whatever you wanted to call it. Um, but what you what you can what you should be using it for is, is basically saying, oh, that doesn't look like what I expected it to. <laughs> that like this isn't connected at all, or this is uh, like I'm completely missing something, or I forgot to do this, right? So it's really useful as a sanity checker. And it's also, once you start getting used to it, you can use it to actually uh, test your, uh, keep track of your training data over time and visualize that. There's histograms and uh, data, scatter plots and all sorts of other features that I, I'm not able to show to you in such a short um, ex uh, live coding session. But there are things there. Yes, sir? Oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, basically when you install TensorFlow, it comes with, uh, when you install it, it comes with this TensorBoard command. So all you're typing is, is TensorBoard, and then we're passing in a logdir flag 
to pass in the directory that we want to uh, use. Okay, so if you recall in the code in here, I called it. I basically said to save it to my graph, and that's why we were able to pass it in here. So cool. There's ways to show it, like within or like the notebook too. There's some crazy like JavaScript somewhere it generates it. Yeah, there's there's third party. Yeah, it's 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 very cool. And uh, TensorBoard is one of those things that everybody knows is is really cool, but th I don't think people appreciate how simple it is to actually start making use of it. Yes, sir. Uh, why is it so small? Can I do this? There we go. So I'll let people write down this simple the, this this code really quickly. Any other questions about uh, TensorBoard? I know that there's a lot of features that I didn't cover, uh, but uh, any anything else that we went over quickly here? Very, very cool. All right, sir. Yes. It says no data. Okay, so that so that that's okay, right? So you'll see that scalar data is so just to describe what you would be doing, right? So uh, I, I, this writer is actually a live object, right? The it's something that you can open up and close as you would any other file writer, right? So what the writer does is you open it up, and when you pass in the session graph, it just says, oh, OK. I, like, because the, gra the graph definition doesn't depend on the, the data flowing through it necessarily. right? It's when we're just talking about the con there are connections. There are these types, like, these types of operations are happening, and they depend on these other nodes. right? It's, as soon as you open up the writer, can say, oh, yeah, I can, I can write down that. And that's what, we're, that's what we get there. But there's a whole lot more we can do with this writer. And that includes uh, a number of summar summary operations. So if you go to the TensorFlow uh, API um, and just look up summary, right, and just search for those, you'll see histogram summaries, you'll see scalar summaries. Uh, and all of those are, you pass those into the writer and basically say, writer dot, you know, add summary um, and put that put the scalar summary in there. You just say, okay, I want to keep track of this weight over time, like every hundred iterations, right? You'll see in sample code it'll do a modulo of your uh, step your training steps. And say, okay, every two hundred steps I want to save the value of this weight and I also want to save the the percentage uh, correct or incorrect that we got. I also want to get the the standard deviation of these val uh, variables and all well, whatever, right? So you can the, the thing with uh, this is it's incredibly flexible. Uh, it is hands-on. You do have to explicitly tell it what you want, but it gives you the power to be able to say it, what you want to save exactly when. And so when you first load up TensorBoard, it'll say no scalar data is found. And you're like, oh god, I fucked up, but you didn't. Don't worry. Right. So, I mean, right. So, over you know, you the people who are doing data science here know that a lot of what we're looking at is how how much better is our model doing over time, over training data uh, iterations, and how and how does it compare to other models in general, and what statistics can we use? to uh, basically get a good sense of whether or not it's doing well. You can have your training error, and then you have your uh, validation error, right? And then your test error. Um, but then you can also just look at things like, you can create, you know, if you, would if you wanted to, you can construct, like create a model that is worth constructing p values for and whatever, right? So the, the key here, right, is I, I've just, Touch like the very very tip of TensorBoard and introduce it as a way for you to visualize your code right as the graph because at the end of the day TensorFlow is all about building a, a computation graph and the more and more you can get used to just thinking of your, your code as well I got circles and I got arrows connecting those circles and this is how I'm going to do it in code 
the more comfortable you are with that concept, the more fluent you're going to become with TensorFlow. And TensorBoard is a great way to immediately give you feedback on how your mental image compares to what TensorFlow is showing you. And, but again, TensorBoard also allows you to do much more sophisticated data analysis, right? As well as just give you, like, doing something as simple as keeping track of your test error over time and giving you that very, you know, the nice downward sloping error rate over time. Is it really desirable to have, like, multiple uh, models running or like, training and then you would compare both? So you wouldn't need to do that. So the, the thing with, some, uh, with TensorBoard is you, you run your graph, and it, TensorBoard saves your, your statistics, right? So we can close this. We can come back tomorrow, right? And it's just saved in this My Graph folder, right? The, it's, it, as much as it's really sad that TensorFlow or TensorBoard doesn't work in real time and show you data flowing through your graph and just like, oh my god, I can see little dots flowing. That'd be really cool. But at the same time, it's also kind of nice. To, it's, it's stable, and you, you come back to it, and you'll have the same statistics. You can use it as uh, a, a, a data dashboard if you're trying to show it to clients or if you're working with colleagues and you need to show them that. You can basically use TensorBoard as that data dashboard. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that just comes down to the type of model you're training. So, and this is, this is something that expands beyond just TensorFlow. This is just model comparison in general. So one example of ways you could do it, right? So obviously you have your, uh, your how, like, does it learn, right? Does your model, like machine learning model, learn, and at the end of your training uh, sessions, which model learn is, has a lower test rate or higher test score. That's one way. But then you can change it and be like, well, there's more to it than that. How, how quickly, right? How quickly does this, uh, does this model train? And you can graph you, the, the learning rate over time, right? Uh, you can do things that are uh, akin to uh, seeing what you can basically visualize. What if we didn't train on the data enough, right? You look at, the, you look at your training graph, and it's, it's still sloping down at a pretty good clip, and then we just stopped. Let's say we only did uh, 3,000 training iterations. And what if we had done 10,000, right? We might be able to have a better idea of, oh, it looked like this model was still learning. Maybe we needed to just run it for longer, right? So it's the, the question of how do you know which model is better, is, is, or how do you compare them? That's it, basically uh, TensorFlow or TensorBoard allows you to keep track of statistics that you would like, right? S statistics that you would think are important for comparing models, training training uh, training rate, the size of you know the size of the model, the number of you can keep track of the number you can calculate the number of parameters going on, or whatever. Though that would stay the same over time. Um. <laughs> Well, I mean, the, I mean, the, at the end of the day, for that, it's not Tensor TensorBoard isn't gonna like be like check mark this one's super better like because we we just know at, like, you know with with all of these machine learning tools right it's it's not just it's not just a magic black box that's gonna be able to to do the critical thinking for you right at the end of the day it's it's what it's gonna try to do is be able to present data to you in a way that is useful and uh, digestible. So have you seen it uh, useful in like, the real example? I mean, bas basically, I use, Tensor I use TensorBoard to keep track of my, uh, my, my, learning, my learning rates, my, like I said before, your test, test validation, training error. Um, it's, it, 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 like, there's, there are, you know, I'm, projects I'm working on right now. Um, I am working on a parking meter, predict, predictive park, parking meter application, right? And so we're able to take a look at the, uh, we can take a look at the percentage of parking meters available at a given time and we can, uh, we can 
uh, filter that by location, right? Uh, we can decide which uh, parking, which areas we want to track for a given cycle, and have that feed into TensorBoard. We can have TensorBoard do all of, like we can do it by block and have TensorBoard keep track of all of the blocks at the same time and have it just be this giant grid. That's not particular like that's a little overwhelming, but you can do it like that. Um, it, it, but at the end of the day, it's tense, it's just a, a nice way to be able to graph information from your uh, from your graph. Well, I mean, this, the, the, again, yeah, yeah. So I would say that if you're in terms of like comparing your model, right? You, you can't look at a, the looking at the graph of the model isn't going to be give you a better way of saying, oh, this model is better because it look at look at look just look at it just look at how much better it is. Uh, yeah, no, th that's better for debugging your your code, right? The, the the use of being able to look at your graph is being able to keep track of uh, making sure that. When you're doing these models, it's very, I find it very useful to actually draw out what, in, what my inputs are, what the, matri like what the matrix sizes are, what's being connected to, what other, if I'm inputting some autoencoder auto off to the side, right, draw that in and make sure that I have all my inputs transformed correctly. So I would say that the, I not, yes sir, um, uh, I would say that the graphing thing that I just showed you is good for debugging and uh, visualizing your code, and the the summary statistics are good for analyzing the su success or uh, the actual training of your of your model. Cool. Yes, sir. So the so it, what will happen is you'll you'll run your session right and. What you'll what you'll end up doing is having a uh, a you'll have a writer operation, right? A summary op. Um, you'll write out all the different summaries that you'd like, and then in general, the useful thing that people do is create uh, use an operation called I think it's collect all summaries uh, or merge all, merge all summaries. And so merge all summaries, all it does is says, OK, I'm going to find all of the summaries. I'm going to bunch them all together so that we can easily run those. And then uh, let's see if I can do this. All right. So So I, I believe, unfortunately, like, unfortunately, this is something that sh I would hope will be uh, updated soon. But when you TensorBoard will pretty much read the data once as the ser when the server is running. And so in order to update with new data, you'll just have to control C and then up hit TensorBoard again. I may be wrong with that, um, but in my experience, it's uh, the server doesn't try to reread data as it changes. Um, so that, that is. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to hold like this guy's got yeah, you have five cool stuff. I hope so. <laughs> Is any there any more like last minute? I know like uh, there's a tensor board. Is you know, I I didn't really get deep enough into it to be able to satisfy satisfy your desires. But um, are, are you feel are you feeling good? Like a complex one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. So we'll sh showcase some more int intricate examples of that. Um, and so I just, I'll tr really try to do this as fast as I can. Um, uh, but I just want to go over, if you want to get deeper into TensorFlow, right? It's because pretty much everything I talked about was fairly high level. And for like people who e just had a curse, like either just heard about it or, um, have, haven't really practiced with it. Okay, so let's talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. And unfortunately, I don't have a huge amount of time to to talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, you guys are learning something, and not feeling like this is a uh, too slow for you all. Uh, but let's let's talk about the code base because TensorFlow is a very cool framework. So. 
Uh, as Chris talked about, we, it starts at the bottom and then it stacks up from there. So at the, at the very root of TensorFlow is your standard C++ library, including heavily, heavy, heavy use of the Eigen library, uh, which if you haven't seen before, check it out. It's very cool, high, highly optimized implementations of matrix out math, right? Then on top of that, we have the TensorFlow core framework. That's where you have your graphs. You have your matrices in C++. You have your operations in C++. And then on top of that, right? so you have the, the, the enterprise level like uh, structure. Then you actually have the implementation of that. And that's in your uh, the TensorFlow slash core slash kernel. Right? You actually see the, the detailed code, and you'll have your, C plus, your, your CPU implementations, you'll have your GPU implementations. Great. Those get compiled, and then we need to figure out a way to connect those to Python. So we use SWIG. SWIG is uh, a native a way of, of connecting like C++ compiled code and hooking that up into higher level uh, languages. In this case, we're using Python. And then you have all the Python library on top of that, OK? So, so what's the difference between Eigen and right, like a Kublas? Or what's the relationship between those? Like, why did they choose Eigen? From what I understand, uh, Eigen has a lot more um, fo focus on scientific uh, math, like mathematical implementations. So you have very efficient implementations of like the hyperbolic tangent function, right? Um, things that are useful in data science that you may not see in the, from the simple, more rudimentary, though very, very useful uh, arithmetic operations that you'd see in other libraries. Who maintains Eigen? Uh, it's, it's a Tux uh, family uh, uh, suite, so I'm not exactly sure the. It's one of the It's an external internal. Okay. But they talk always, uh, it's so deeply integrated that they always talk about Eigen. Okay, so Google-ish, uh, but yeah, it's. I mean, I mean, it's something that I did more research on after I saw TensorFlow. Um, it's, you know, it's got pretty good documentation, uh, though the website does look like it's from 1997. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's. You, I highly recommend checking out Eigen because if you want, if you're interested in getting into implementing your own code in uh, TensorFlow. If you know C++ or are interested in learning more about the, this sort of implementation, uh, learning Eigen, or at least getting a good sense of the basic Eigen IP APIs, will give you a, a much more comfortable time looking at the TensorFlow core code as it calls a lot of Eigen uh, code. So I wanted, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to go over the, just the structure of the, the TensorFlow um, repository because it's not explicitly made clear what what's what and where you'll find things right um, and then I just want to quickly go over some ba basic concepts if you do if you are already doing it or thinking about getting into implementing your own uh, operations we're going to be doing more of that at the uh, at the workshop next Saturday uh, but it's just too much to try to cover, as <laughs> you, you guys see how long it takes me to get through the basics. Um, we, we weren't able to, to be able to showcase a real operation. But we're going to go over the structure of the code and then talk about basics, and then I'll pass it off to Fabrizio. So, By the way, all the code from the workshops is going to be totally made public. This is, mm -hmm. uh, no, we're not keeping it. It's just, okay, we just don't have time for it tonight. Mm -hmm. So, um, so basically, when you get into your TensorFlow, the, the, you go to the TensorFlow repository. It's, a, it's structured like a, a Python project, which means that the first folder that you need to go into is actually called TensorFlow. Right? So you go to the main repository, you have the README, you'll see a bunch of, you know, you see a folder called third party, and you'll see some other things. Just for your, the meat of the actual TensorFlow implementation, go into the TensorFlow folder. And then from there, we're, we're running. So the first, the big important folder that you'll see is core. So core has all the C++, pretty much all the C++ implementations. It has the kernels. It has uh, the framework itself. And it has the, the so-called registration of the operations. So uh, the ins inside of TensorFlow slash core, you have these further folders. Ops is the, the registration of the operation signatures. 
the way that TensorFlow works is that it has a, uh, a fairly sophisticated and uh, integrated uh, way of basically saying, OK, I'm going to have these operations available to me. And in order for this to run, it needs exactly these, these parameters. right? So the, that's registered in core slash ops. And then in the kernels is the actual implementation of this, of this code. right? You'll see. Um, some f files that end with uh, .c .cuda.cc, is that right? Um, and th or those are the GPU implementations. And then you'll see files that are .h, your header files. You'll see .cc files. But if you want to just look at all the, pretty much all the operations in TensorFlow, you can go right into core slash kernels. Uh, if you go into core slash framework, you'll actually see the, the enterprise edition uh, big, like the, the structure, right? The, the bones holding everything up. Um, and then inside a platform is, are the abstractions that allow them to uh, you know, basically abstract away different operating systems. Then if you go, instead of going into the core folder inside of TensorFlow, you go into Python, you'll see the Python implementations. You'll see wrappers. You'll see test, uh, testing. You'll see um, gradient implementations. Um, <coughs> and you'll see the, 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 ten, the uh, fundamental Python code. Something that I wanted to write in, uh, if you compile, if you install TensorFlow, there's files in, the, in your installed <coughs> version that you won't see in the repository, the so-called gen files. And if you want to really see sort of what's going on, you can look. Go, go into your either Python or con, uh, Anaconda folder, find your Python library, and look at that, gen, those gen files. And then finally, there's the contrib folder. Uh, there are other folders in there. Uh, but the, the last main one is this contrib folder. And that contains contributed uh, files or uh, pro parts of the TensorFlow project that aren't fully adopted yet. Um, yeah, and then basically, there's so much documentation inside the code that the only way that, that has yet to be written properly in tutorials, that the only way to get yourself in, like, into fully to understand it is to dive right in and start reading the documentation in the code. Luckily, the, the Google does a very good job at documenting their code with comments. So just if you don't understand something, just go in and go in deeper, right? If the easiest way to get in there is to, if you see a function or a class that you don't understand, go up to the top of your uh, C++ file, look for the include statement that looks like it goes with it, and open up that file and start sort of diving deeper and going down and deeper and deeper the rabbit, down the rabbit hole. Right? And each one of those should have really solid um, explanations and like. Uh, yeah, it's just going to be a, a, a wild romp. And I had some things to, like, so it's like just so you know, like this is like this TensorFlow C++ implementation stuff isn't fully documented. It's not documented like anywhere except in code, right? So the only way to know how to use a tensor when building an operation is to actually look in the documentation itself, or to look look at the code itself. Okay. We'll, we'll, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. I've been somewhat files worth checking out. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's just a lot of very cool like uh, utility files, uh, very cool classes that are included in the TensorFlow library that aren't mentioned. There is a, a how-to on the TensorFlow website called adding an op, right? How do you add an op in TensorFlow? But for many purposes, it's, it's not really complete. It goes over the the, the high level view right of what you need to do but it doesn't talk about what the, what actu like the actual C++ API that you need to, to call in order to make the tensor do the thing you want to do right um, so there are a lot of really useful macros and classes that are available in the library that Google that is being used in the code but isn't made explicitly clear to uh, contributors. So I want you guys. I encourage you guys to like go in there, just start crawling and d diving. It's incredibly well documented. So just get in there, learn learn the the code, and have a have a, a good time with it. And again, if you want to uh, contribute, they do a fantastic job of really making you feel comfortable with your code and making your code better. Right? And it's your code that's getting better. It's not them 
it's not them changing it and then being like, thanks, I guess. It's just like, okay, can you, like here, here's a, th here's a thought, try this. And then you work on it and you give it back to them. It's a, it's a solid back and forth. So the term kernel here, I mean, in CUDA, yeah, that term. Oh, uh, yes. So, yeah, so in, in CUDA, like uh, G GPU processing, you have this, the idea of a kernel that is the, the code that's going to run on each of your threads, I, I believe, right? More or less, right? In, um, in TensorFlow, the kernel is simply a C++ implementation of an operation, right? It's the code that's actually running when you call your Python like function at the top, right? Cool? No. Yeah. So the word, I mean, the thing is, the the term kernels used <laughs> all the time these days. You use it as it, kernels are used for image processing. They're used for. Um, I mean, it makes sense with oh, with co convolutional. Yeah, exactly. Uh, convolutional neural networks, which often are used for image processing, right? Um, in, in in TensorFlow. When you hear a uh, kernel in general, that just means uh, an operation implementation, or uh, yeah, that's what that means. Each time, so there could be multiple kernels per, per operation? Like yeah, so the, basically you can have a kernel for standard CPU implementation, then you can have a kernel for GPU implementation and TPU implementation. So do people submit their own kernel implementation that's faster than the Google one? In fact, they do. There's this long-standing, uh, is it the LSTM operation that the that uh, w this uh, very very uh, talented uh, contributor um, is working has been working on, um, and it's it's supposed to supposedly 50 percent faster than the current LSTM operation. Um, so yeah, if you if you know that like this isn't done right, you feel free to re-implement it yourself. Yeah, this sounds very similar to Spark. Like when people back in the early days like thought that they could get their like ML implementations into the code base and they would prove that they're faster. And the Spark people would say no, we'll put it in Spark dash packages and things like that. Yeah, I mean the, the TensorFlow people are. Uh, for better or for worse, there's an incredible amount of attention being paid on just raw speed, right? Which is important when you're training like very sophisticated uh, models. Uh, and because of that, the Google the the Google team working on this is very interested in having correct, fast implementations happening. So if you know that there's a better way to do this as a faster implementation, you go for it, right? Because they they will love that, right? Yes. Yeah, so what's Google? You know, people. I love like like I know people like saying like, oh, Google's holding out on the good stuff from us. Like, uh, Google, you tease us. Um, here's the th here's the thing, right? Google is is really is interested in having as many people learning this software in as fully as humanly possible. Uh, for all, from what I understand, right, and from what I can tell, and from the actions of the, the developers over time, the only parts that aren't in uh, the only parts that are not in TensorFlow, right, especially at this point, are the things that are so deep, deeply ingrained within Google's internal infrastructure that it isn't even relevant to TensorFlow by itself, right. So the, the, they work their butts off to try to get the, the d distributed implementation out, which is what we're going to look at next. Uh, and they're, they're constantly just taking, out inter taking internal uh, changes and pushing them to the, uh, to the public repository. Right? They want people to know this. They're interested in having people who know TensorFlow possibly uh, come in to work with Google and not have to worry about having to learn TensorFlow from scratch, right? So Google has ever, like, no reason to hide the good stuff, really. They're, they would rather have more people use TensorFlow so that they can have more collaboration and have more good implementations come in for, uh, from the uh, public. Yeah, see, I get nervous. Right? Like, yes, I saw Guava when they first or like open source Guava, and they didn't take anyone's contribution. Right? It, was, it, it was an open source project that no one could actually contribute to. 
Yeah, Google does a very good job of trying to trying to like even if the the initial code is uh, isn't up to up to par, they work with they work very hard to try to make it good enough, and they want they want the people contributing to feel like they're valued, right? And yeah. Yes, how long has your uh, like pull request been out there? Did they ever take it? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit. Uh, some of those. Uh, some, is it really like special? Yeah, because you were like adding operations, right? And maybe they didn't feel the operations. I'm just playing. Yeah. So Fabrizio, one of the many things that he's contributed, he imp he implemented the Adagrad um, optimization. It, like he did, he imp did that implementation for TensorFlow. And so it's like that was a pretty lengthy and intensive contribution. Mucho props, moi, <laughs> moi props. <laughs> Stochastic. So that's like gradient descent, but a different. It's a form of. Uh, it's a, it's yes. Formula, so you yeah, the exact the exact the exact number that you use uh, as your vector is different um, for diff, you know different reasons, right? It's an optimization. Exactly. You can think for all intents and purposes, you can look at it the same way you would regular gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent or anything like that. In any case, thank you so much for putting up with my incredibly long uh, presentation. Thank you so much for sticking with me.